Laura, welcome to the podcast. Today, we're talking about the hidden sources of toxins lurking in our home, especially in our kitchen. My number one question is, what is the absolute worst cookware that we should not be using when it comes to our kitchen? For me, it's it's nonstick coated cookware, which is so pervasive. I don't know anybody that, you know, the average person will will undoubtedly have some some nonstick coated cookware in their homes, whether it's a frying pan or a stock pot or their cookie sheets that they're baking cookies on. All of those are nonstick for the most part. Um, and so this is something that is absolutely qualifies as a relatively simple and relatively low cost um, sort of intervention to reduce exposure to some of these persistent toxic chemicals, these PFAS chemicals that, you know, a lot of people are learning about now just for the first time. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. Nonstick cookware is where we should start if we're looking to minimize um, chronic exposures. And what is nonstick cookware and the PFAS that are inside of it? What have those been linked or connected to when it comes to different ways of making our body say, ouch? Yeah, so I'll, I'll back up a little bit before I get to that answer. So the PFAS stands for perfluoral alkyl substances. It's an enormous class of chemicals. Um, it's estimated that there's over 14,000 different chemicals in this class. Um, not all of those are used in cookware. Uh, there are certain specific chemicals that are used in cookware. Um, unfortunately, science, scientists, we don't know the um, anything about the vast majority of those 14,000 chemicals. We don't even know their molecular structure. We are just completely in the dark. Um, the primary chemicals that are used in the manufacturing of nonstick coatings are some of the most studied PFAS chemicals around because they've been in use for since the 1950s, really. So we have the most data on those types of chemicals that are used in nonstick uh, cookware and other applications. They're found in firefighting foam and stain resistant treatments for your couch and your raincoat and things like that. So they're not just in our cookware, um, but we do know that these chemicals are linked uh, to a wide variety of serious health issues, everything from um, fertility issues, pregnancy induced hypertension, um, cholesterol issues, um, alterations to our immune systems that make um, a vaccine response uh, weakened. So we have a weakened uh, re response to beneficial vaccines that we need to get. So that's concerning. Um, there's an increased risk of certain types of cancer uh, for uh, these PFAS chemicals. Um, there, I can keep going. There's uh, associations with liver damage, um, with thyroid disease, with risk of asthma. So like there's a lot of uh, health effects that are associated with exposure to PFAS chemicals, which is why I think it's on the top of the list of um, exposures to work towards minimizing. Well, something mind-blowing, and I recommend everybody here follow you on Instagram, something mind-blowing that I learned from your content is that nonstick cookware releases over 9,000 PFAS particles. And the scarier part is a broken or scratched pan can release more than 2 million nanoparticles, right? That to me is super scary. Why should we all be a little bit afraid of that exposure that comes in? Well, I think it's it's scary and it's not. So I do want to contextualize. Please, that's why we brought that, you on. Yes, that figure. So like those are high numbers, um, but I think we have to look at those types of exposures of millions of nanoparticles of PFAS from a single scratch on a piece of nonstick cookware and compare that to say all the other exposure sources that we're getting. Like the number is big, but how does that big number compare to other exposures? Um, we know that a lot of um, cities around the country, a lot of cities around the world have PFAS in the drinking water. That's an immediate ingestible source. Um, there's PFAS particles, um, probably in the air that we breathe just because they're being released from, uh, you know, your cookware or your stain resistant treatment on the couch. So when we're talking about PFAS exposures, I don't think there's, aside from an occupational exposure, which you're going to be getting a significantly higher level of exposure, I don't think that there's any single source exposure, whether that's from cookware or from drinking water, that is the boogeyman here. It's just 
all PFAS exposures across the board should be minimized. I do love that we have research looking into sort of the practical way that people interact with materials like cookware and saying, hey, you know, every every Airbnb I've ever stayed in that has cookware and you open up the cabinet, it is like the absolute dregs of the worst. It is like a 10-year-old scratched, cheap, nonstick pan. I've done uh, Instagram stories where I'm like, oh God, I have to cook on this because I'm traveling. Um, and so, you know, yes, that's not ideal, but in the grand scheme of things, we, you know, it's, it's, it's an avoidable source and we should look to avoid it. But I don't think that anybody needs to panic over this. Um, I think the reality is uh, around the environmental toxicity conversation is that for better and worse, mostly for worse, in my opinion, a lot of the way that the information about toxics um, is presented, especially on social media, is in this very kind of overhyped up, um, sensationalized manner. Everything is a four alarm fire. Everything is something that we need to panic over. And in my mind, from a practical perspective, I'm like, look, it's 2024. We are all, we are all stressed out. We do not need more things to panic over in our lives. That doesn't mean that we don't need to pay attention. And that doesn't mean that we don't need to take action. I think we do. But my, I feel like a big part of my job is actually tempering people's anxiety, educating, making them aware, and then tempering the anxiety that comes. So yeah, I do think it's super concerning that we are using nonstick cookware most people do not follow the manufacturer's instructions of only using wooden utensils and, and silicone soft. They're using metal spatulas. They just are. This is the reality of it. Every Airbnb uh, uh, nonstick scratched up nonstick pan tells me so, right? So the reality of how people are using it um, doesn't jive with you know, what the manufacturers are telling us to do. So I do think research into that space is enlightening and it can help us shift our buying patterns and buying better and safer cookware. No, I love that about your message. It's sounding the alarm because this is very important, right? Because on the flip side, you have extreme people in the wellness space that everything is a four alarm fire, yeah. but then you have the other side of it, yeah. which is that everything is safe. Yes. Everything is tested. Everything is reviewed by the FDA, which is actually not true. We're gonna get yeah. to that in a little bit. Yeah. And so we need a little bit of a balance that's there sounding the alarm, which I like to do on this podcast, but then saying we don't need to get anxious about anything. And in fact, providing people with the often low cost yeah. solutions that are there that can help them do better. So let's start off with that since we're on the topic of cookware. If cooking with nonstick is you know, the worst option and choice that's there, but we don't need to be anxious about it. Yeah. What should people be moving towards that is a better solution and also could be a low cost solution for themselves? Yeah. I mean, stainless steel and cast iron are going to be my sort of ride or die um, for cookware. They are both inexpensive. You can go to Home Goods or to Walmart or to Costco or, or Target or any of these big box stores and find perfectly good, inexpensive. Uh, stainless steel cookware that doesn't have any kind of coating on the inside. It's not nonstick coated. Um, and you can similarly find cast iron cookware. I think the resistance um, to using those materials comes from people not actually knowing how to cook, which is, in, is a different problem in and of itself, right? So nonstick cookware means that there's a way larger margin of error in cooking. You can burn something a little bit and it's still not going to stick. Um, and so some of it is a learning curve. Like you do have to learn how to use stainless steel cookware and how to use and clean and care for cast iron cookware. Whereas, um, uh, you know, nonstick cookware is kind of lazy in that way. Like it's easy to clean, uh, and it's easy to use. And so a lot of it is cooking technique, but stainless steel and cast iron are readily available, um, and really inexpensive. I've had the same um, Lodge cast iron uh, griddle, which is a flat pan. I've had that for 25 years and it cost me $18 when I bought it. I'm still using the same cookware that my father bought me as a gift in college <laughs> that's stainless steel. Like, I, I, I think what happens is 
again, because of cheap materials and people not really taking care of them or knowing how to use them, they get scratched up, people throw them out, they buy new, the same thing happens. Um, Non-stick coatings, same thing with the, um, the newer, and we can certainly talk about these, the um, ceram quote unquote ceramic coated cookware, um, is that these coatings don't last and people are buying cookware over and over and over again. You should buy cookware one time. Mm. Get good cookware, and then you literally never have to buy it again. Totally. So it's it's not just about you know finding the best solution; it's finding the most economical solution that people are going to stick with for the long haul, right? And sustainable, right? Because all of those scratch nonstick pans and all of those um, ceramic coated pans that have worn off, they're all just sitting in the landfill somewhere, millions and millions of them. You go to the manufacturers, the websites of the companies that manufacture nonstick coatings and ceramic coated cookware, and you'll see on average, they, they, the lifespan of these pans at most is three to five years. They say that right on their websites. Um, I can tell you from my Instagram comments when I've posted about these types of um, cookware items, in particular, the ceramic coated, sometimes they last six months, one year, and people are replacing them. And to me, that's just a, such a colossal waste of money and resources. It's not sustainable. So stainless steel, a great option. Cast iron, a great option. Those are going to stick with you for a long time. Is there a splurge option for people who are like, hey, listen, I'm still a little bit concerned. I know the data is not fully shaken out, but I've heard people say things like, stainless steel, there might be heavy metals that are there. Do those heavy metals end up into some part of our body or brain? Is there a splurge option that again, is not going to be the thing that we recommend for most people. They just yeah. need good enough and they just need to exercise, stay away from ultra processed foods, get great sleep, have great community, and just even eat more at home in the first place. Your life is going to be radically better than 99% of the population, right? So let's yeah. get that out of the way. But is there a splurge option that's out there? Yeah. I mean, there's things like titanium cookware um, that have a pretty high price tag, in my opinion. So they're not accessible, uh, very accessible to people. That, But if people have those kind of resources and they want to spend more, something like a titanium cookware is not going to have um, those type, it's not, not going to release any of those type of um, heavy metals that, or metals that can be uh, present in something like a stainless steel. So stainless steel will have some percentage of chromium and nickel. There is evidence that scratched uh, stainless steel, which is, you know, you can still scratch stainless steel, um, uh, can release some nickel or chromium. Um, unless somebody has a severe nickel allergy, which certainly some people do, um, and they will know how to navigate shopping to avoid that. Um, the 1810 that you often see as a designation for stainless steel is a reflection of the percentage of chromium and nickel. So it's 18% chromium and 10% nickel. You can get 18.8, 18.0, which has no nickel. Um, and so those options are out there. They're harder to find. They're a little expensive. But on the whole, sort of in the grand, I, I have a tendency to both zoom in and zoom out. And if I'm zooming out and I'm looking at what researchers refer to as the exposome, which is the sort of totality of our toxic exposures, um, the chromium and nickel that we might get from our stainless steel pans is so low on the list, on the priority list, there are so much bigger fish to fry. And I don't want people getting lost in the weeds and focusing on this minute aspect of exposure that like we just don't have a lot of evidence to say... Uh, it's linked to all of these serious health issues when we do have that evidence for things like PFAS. Oh, that's super helpful. Well, you're taking us on the tour of the kitchen. Today's episode is about the kitchen and the top sources of hidden toxins that are out there and how to both be aware, but not have anxiety and then take action towards better solutions. Another area that you have been sounding the alarm on is often these cheaper plastics that many of us are using in our home to both store food in, to microwave food in, and to sometimes even, um, uh, you know, heat stuff up in, which is kind of yeah. crazy, yeah. right? So talk to us about plastics and what are the top sources of those toxic exposures that come from plastics? Yeah, so it's a, it's a big conversation. And I'll say this, that the chemicals that are found in plastics 
that migrate out from plastics in our food. They're also found in many other places, right? So if we just avoid, so for example, like phthalates, phthalates is a plasticizer. It's used to make certain types of plastics more soft and flexible and resilient. So things like a garden hose or a shower curtain, or say a squeezable ketchup bottle or a squeezable, um, you know, uh, I don't know. What else do you squeeze out of a plastic jar? Mayonnaise, I guess. Um, mayonnaise, mustard, Yeah, mayonnaise, ketchup. mustard, all those things. And so phthalates are used there, but phthalates are also in your personal care products. They're also in all your uh, scented household cleaners and your, your perfume and your scented candles and your air fresheners. So there's multiple sources of these chemicals. And so sometimes, you know, from a practical lens, um, I do think going room by room and kind of going through this checklist and saying, okay, cookware, done. Food storage, done. Food, done. And you can, from a practical level, kind of move through that list. It's too hard from an individual level to say, ah, oh, I'm going to start addressing the phthalates in my life. Um, because we don't, there's hundreds and hundreds of different exposure sources. So it can get a little overwhelming. It can get so overwhelming. And so from, like I said, from a practical lens, I just think it's easier for us to move kind of room by room or category by category. If our goal is to sort of strategically minimize our exposures, um, generally speaking, I encourage, um, people to start using the framework of like what's free and what's easy. Um, and cookware, certainly making those changes isn't free, but it's easier, right? It requires some degree of investment, but it doesn't have to, it does not have to cost a lot of money. Um, same thing with plastics. What we're wanting to do is minimize our um, direct food contact with plastic. We're never going to eliminate plastic entirely from our lives. Um, my headphones are made of plastic, my computer, my monitor, all these things um, are using plastic. And so I'm not trying to make Luddites out of everybody and push us back to like the Middle Ages. Um, but when it comes to food contact or anything that we ingest, food, liquids, whatever, that's really where we want to prioritize minimizing our toxic exposure because of direct ingestion of these chemicals. Um, and there's hundreds and hundreds of chemicals that are released from plastics. Uh, and it depends on what type of plastic it is. Styrofoam, for example, is technically a type of plastic. And the chemicals that are released from styrofoam, styrene, are not the same types of chemicals that are released from, say, a PET, polyethylene terephthalate plastic bottle, which is your standard, like, drinking uh, bottled water, like a Poland Spring bottle. So different chemicals are going to release from different plastics. Um, but we're looking at things like phthalates, styrene, bisphenols um, that are going to release. And these are, uh, styrene is a carcinogen, phthalates and bisphenols are endocrine disrupting. They can mess with our hormones. And we are exposed to these chemicals from so many different sources. Um, as it pertains to uh, plastics, we do know that there are, that plastics will leach chemicals regardless if they're just like sitting on the shelf existing in space and we're not interacting with them over time they will release these compounds the molecules of these chemicals that are used to give plastic their distinct properties of rigidness or softness or whatever um they're not molecularly bound to the matrix of the plastic so they just kind of fall out um, the, a, a example of this, um, is if you've ever seen like a vintage, like an old lamp with an electrical cord and it's brittle and it cracks, or if you're looking at an old car from the sixties and the dashboard is brittle. And the reason why it's brittle is because the plasticizers that have lent that plastic softness and resiliency have just migrated out over time. Right. So we know that that to be true. We also know that things like heat, oil, acidity, abrasion, all things that plastics encounter when we're putting food in them or heating them, increase the speed, the rate at which these chemicals migrate. And that's why it's concerning for plastic use in the kitchen, for storing leftovers, for um, heating food in the microwave in plastic. I mean, that message about don't heat Plastics in the microwave has been going on for decades now. Um, for a long time, the idea was, or the thought was that like, oh, it's, it might cause a fire. It's bad for the container. Not that it's bad for us, 
So when you see the words microwave safe plastic on a plastic container, that doesn't mean it's, it just means it's not going to melt and catch fire. That's all that means. It's a microwave safe. Um, people look at the word safe and they're like, ah, safe for me. <laughs> but that's not the case. And so again, we just want to be minimizing our exposure to these chemicals that are coming out of our um, plastics as much as possible. Let's zoom out a little bit big picture because we know that some of these plastics and the broader topic of environmental toxins, that there is some links to some of them um, being connected to, you know, things like cancers in the environment, right? Yeah. In fact, you had a great uh, post just a few days ago. I took a screenshot of it. I'll have our team put it up on here so that people can watch it on YouTube. In that post you wrote, Cancer is one of the leading causes of death, yet evidence suggests that lifestyle modifications can prevent 30 to 50% of all cancer cases. I don't think that most people know that statistic, right? No. 30 to 50%. Obviously, it's much broader than just plastics. We're talking about lifestyle habits, exercise, yeah. which has a lot of demonstrated ability to help us prevent cancer, being metabolically healthy. But of course, the environmental toxins conversation also plays into this. Do you want to talk about that too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, to, to your point, only a small percentage of cancers have a genetic component. And when we know that, we know that the remaining uh, cancers are environmental. And to your point, environmental means not just chemical exposures. It means, do you smoke? What's your metabolic health? All those things. Um, and we know that those are preventable. And even with the genetic component, we do know through the field of epigenetics that we can sort of dampen some of the expression of those um, genes associated with disease by modifying our lifestyle. So doing all of the, you know, very typical eating well, sleeping, managing your stress, all those things as sort of generic health uh, uh, guidelines, we know that that can sort of dampen the expression of some of these cancer associated genes. So lots of reasons to adopt a healthy lifestyle. Um, but yeah, the toxic chemical component is, um, I think, just overlooked. There are so many different uh, uh, exposures to carcinogens that we get. There's also exposures to chemicals that aren't directly classified as carcinogens, but can have downstream consequences that can lead to cancers um, as a result. So for example, um, prenatal phthalate exposure. Phthalates are, again, that plasticizer, they're an endocrine disrupting chemical. Um, prenatal phthalate exposure and exposure um, as a young child for girls uh, can introduce their body to these synthetic estrogens, which phthalates can behave like a, like a synthetic estrogen um, for a long period of time. And we certainly know that a woman's um, uh, lifetime exposure to estrogen is directly related to her risk of developing breast cancer. And the more years that she has exposure to estrogen or synthetic estrogen, because our bodies cannot tell the difference, um, the greater the uh, risk of her developing breast cancer in the future. So like there are things like that where phthalates aren't classified as a carcinogen per se, but we do have evidence of downstream cancer related consequences. Um, and, and I think that that's, you know, there are, look, there's 350,000 chemicals and chemical mixtures, um, registered for use around the globe. Uh, this, we only, this is a recent number, I think from 2021, um, analysis that was, uh, three times the previous estimates, meaning like, we don't really know what is going on globally. And like, we're only just being like, Hey, uh, maybe we should pay attention to this. Uh, it's kind of gotten out of hand, right? So um, uh, I, I, I think I'm from New England, so I always think of an analogies like in the fall when you're trying to rake leaves and the big gust of wind blows and it's just all, and you're, I feel like this is us chasing individual leaves that are just blowing all over the place, uh, untethered unregulated, uncontrolled. And we're just like, we're picking up this leaf and going, is this leaf okay? Meanwhile, there's like a tsunami of leaves behind us, right? So we just have this <laughs> sort of flawed approach. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so like there's these massive quantity of, of toxic chemicals, or I should say chemicals, we don't know if they're all toxic. Certainly many of them are not, um, that are in commerce. And we know that 
toxic chemicals specifically touch every single organ system in the body. No tissue is spared from some downstream consequence of, of those exposures. And we're still learning what those consequences are. And so cancer is absolutely going to be uh, on that list of endpoints for a lot of those, uh, a lot of the chemicals that we are exposed to on a daily basis. You know, yeah, on the topic of cancer, you shared an incredible post just the other day saying, featuring a new study showing that 921 chemicals are linked to breast cancer, which is first of all, mind blowing, right? And all this, every week, there's a new headline, nanoplastics yeah. in bottled water. You know, that was one that recently came out. Every year, we're learning more and more. And this is all showcasing the idea that even though people in the industry say that, hey, look, these things are regulated, they're safe. The truth is, and this is what you're trying to highlight through your work, is that we actually don't know, primarily because there's no long-term studies. That's one thing. But then there's something else, which is called the cocktail effect yes. that you talk yeah. about. Can you talk yeah. about the cocktail effect and how it really shines a light of why we as consumers need to be proactive about the combination of all these things? You know, I've talked to countless experts, skincare specialists, and even plastic surgeons who all tell me that red light therapy is one of the best therapies we can use on our skin. And my favorite red light device is Loombox. I love Loombox because number one, it's portable and simple to use. Number two, it's FDA registered. And number three, best of all, it's affordable. Personally, red light therapy has helped me improve the appearance of my skin. It's also helped me with muscle and pain recovery. And red light therapy has also been shown to improve multiple studies on inflammation, wound healing, hair, and it's even been shown to stimulate our mitochondria. I use this device every single night before bed, and it's the perfect way to wind down. I swear it's helped me sleep better. Right now, Loombox is offering my community $260 off their portable red light device that's over 50% off. Just go to theloombox.com slash Drew to get your device. I know you're going to love it. Yeah, so I'll just back up to contextualize. So the um, vast majority of the time, uh, when chemicals are studied, they're studied in isolation. And this is just because the less number of variables in any type of experiment or study, the easier it is to translate the data because it's very clear that there's just this one component. And so the vast majority of research that we have on most things, but certainly on chemicals uh, and chemical exposure, are happening on single chemicals. What happens if I give rodents, because we don't test chemicals on people. Historically, there have been some incidences uh, of this, which are not good, but as a general rule in ethics, we don't test chemicals directly on people. I do have an interesting study I can share with you if you remind me that we did um, and got some interesting results. Um, but uh, as a general rule, we don't test chemicals on people. We use animal models for that. And then there's also some computer mo mo uh, modeling that we can use. Um, and so what we're looking at in rodent studies is, you know, oftentimes they're really, really high doses of exposure. They're just trying to ascertain like, hey, what is happening here? Um, and ideally, if it's a well-constructed uh, constructed study, uh, researchers are also exploring what are referred to as background exposures or environmentally relevant exposures, which are really just parallels to what humans are getting just by living our normal everyday lives, like the levels of chemicals that are showing up in us, researchers are now starting to examine those levels in rodents uh, in, in other uh, animal models. And so we look at the animal model research and we draw some conclusions and we hopefully will figure out what is the mechanism here? How is this exposure causing a, a metabolic disease or cardiovascular disease? Um, and then we look at human epidemiological data, which is just population-wide studies of people. And we say, hey, let's see how much, uh, how, how, how much PFAS or how much bisphenols or how much phthalates are showing up in the population. And what are the associations to these various health effects? And a lot, oftentimes what we're seeing is we're seeing an exact mirror or a very close mirror in human populations of what we know to be true in animal models. And this is the way that science is conducted in this arena. 
And so, yes, there are going to be people out there that are still kind of poo-pooing this whole topic and kind of not taking it seriously enough. Um, but the reality is that we now have decades, 40, 50 plus years of studies. And like you said, the volume of studies coming out is increasing exponentially for folks who are PubMed literate. They want to go into PubMed, search for, say, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and PubMed will show you a timeline of studies that kind of are flagged by that keyword search. And it's like this, the graph just goes whoosh, sky high because um, the volume of research has just escalated um, because people are learning more and they're more aware. And so all of this, going back to your question about the cocktail effect, is now we're starting to see, okay, what happens or can, can we do research that might reflect, again, that exposome, the totality of our exposures. And we're starting that process by looking at um, what is referred to as the cocktail effect, which is spe specifically um, when we are exposed to multiple chemicals at the same time, which is the reality, how do those chemicals interact in the body with each other and with our physiology? And that's much harder research to do but we are learning, for example, that um, with endocrine disrupting chemicals, the chemicals that can alter and interfere with our hormones, um, is that the effect of, of exposure to multiple endocrine disrupting chemicals at the same time can be amplifying. So one plus one may not equal two. One plus one may, may equal five or 10, meaning when we're exposed to multiple of these endocrine disrupting chemicals, the effect can be way more ampli amplified. And we can't just make these general assumptions that one plus one equals two in these situations. Um, and this is, again, why I think it's so important that as a species, frankly, in the absence of more strict federal regulations around the world, um, because I'm not going to wait for that to happen, that uh, wheels of progress move incredibly slowly. Um, in the absence of federal regulations, the onus does really fall on the shoulders of the consumer to be as proactive as possible. And, and again, the goal is to reduce as many of those exposures that we're getting um, in as many places as possible, uh, while also like, you know, being a human being on the earth and not trying to, this is where I usually use the plastic bubble joke. I think of like the bubble boy from Seinfeld. Um, but like the, for me, the plastic bubble joke is like, well, what kind of plastic is it? And is the plastic off gassing? Ha ha ha. Um, but, you know, <laughs> like we can't live in that bubble. We have to live in the world. And um, to my point earlier about like people getting really stressed, stressed out and anxious is we want to find the balance between taking action and being proactive, minimizing our exposure, and then also not amping up our own anxiety and stress and panic because mm. stress is also toxic. Stress is also incredibly detrimental to our overall health. So it is a balance. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, it's an important balance. And I think like I, uh, I, uh, we said before we started recording, I think a lot of the conversation on social media in particular is not balanced and it's causing anxiety. It's causing panic. And that's, that's not it for me at least. And yeah, and that's exactly what we want this conversation to be today. We don't want it to add to the anxiety. We want it to take away from the anxiety, knowing that there's a lot of solutions. On the topic of plastics, what are the main sources that you see every day when you walk into somebody's home and they ask you, hey, you know, what should I be removing? Again, going room to room and we're in the kitchen. What are the things that people can make easy swaps for in their yeah. home? And, and, and what are the key ways of using uh, especially these lighter plastics in the home um, that that we want to greatly minimize. Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 um, we just want to start with food storage. You know, what are we storing our leftovers in? That's really easy, um, and we just want to move to a glass container. Uh, you know, ten years ago, ten twelve years ago, when I first started doing this work, um, the only glass containers I could find were like ball mason jars which are great. I have a whole cupboard filled with like dozens and dozens of mason jars. They make great storage. They're inexpensive. Target sells them. Walmart sells them. Hardware stores sell them. They're really accessible. Um, uh, now there's more and more on the shelf at all these big box stores on Amazon, wherever you want to order from, um, glass food storage containers. Some of them are going to have a plastic lid 
Um, and that's okay. My recommendation there, just again, from a practical perspective is just don't fill it up so that it, your food's touching the lid. That's all. Um, just leave a little bit of space so that your food isn't directly touching the plastic lid. Um, that's going to be a better solution, but these are really inexpensive. Um, and you know, for people that might be on a really restrictive budget, you know, reuse a glass pickle jar or a glass pasta sauce jar. Like there are, I mean, I did that, um, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, that's what I was doing. I just saved all my jam jars <laughs> and put all my leftovers in those types of jars. So there are more accessible options, but, you know, a, a case of, you know, uh, a, a dozen quart size mason jars is like $15. So, you know, less, just over a dollar a jar um, is a really inexpensive um, and really versatile way to swap out plastics when it comes to putting our leftovers in. And then the number two thing is, uh, you know, the the plastic plates and cups, um, especially for kids, they don't need those. You can get uh, stainless steel plates if people are concerned about breakage. Um, you can get, um, there are some companies um, that make, uh, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, that make um, uh, like the borosilicate glass plates that are like pretty shatterproof. Like you can chuck it across I, I know because I try, I'm a little bit clumsy and I've dropped them myself um, a number of times and I have those and they just, they just bounce. Um, and so there are safer options that are inexpensive um, that aren't plastic. I see a lot of people that have kids where they have plastic drink cups, plastic plates and bowls, plastic utensils. I think um, that's just an unnecessary exposure. Children are the most vulnerable when it comes to toxic exposures because their bodies are still developing. And so we want to prioritize minimizing exposures for them. Um, this is also true for anybody that's pregnant in the preconception planning space. Like that is the most vulnerable population. So um, the things that we eat and drink on in terms of plastic containers, um, as an exercise, I encourage people who are maybe just starting on this journey to go into their kitchens and just open up all the cabinets. You don't have to do anything. Just like open the drawers and cabinets and observe how much is plastic? Is your pasta strainer plastic? Are your mixing bowls plastic? Are all of your cooking utensils, those black nylon um, plastic, cheap plastic utensils that melt if you leave them too, you know, in the, in the pan too much? Um, and just start making a mental checklist of like, okay, what are the items that I use the most? And just start swapping those out with better materials, stainless steel, glass, um, uh, you know, for dishware, ceramic instead of plastic, um, you know, metal utensils are totally fine to use if you're not using a nonstick cookware, which hopefully you're not. Right. And so that's really sort of step two in the process is just eliminating the plastics that you're using. Step three, which is a little bit harder and certainly comes with a degree of privilege is looking for foods when you're grocery shopping that are preferentially packaged in glass over plastic. So that means ketchup comes in a glass jar. Your sauerkraut is packaged in glass versus plastic. Um, this is sort of the extra step. Uh, and I also you know, want to be clear that just for the sake, I'll use as an example, like sauerkraut or fermented foods. Like we know those are super beneficial to our health. We want people to be eating more for more fermented foods. Um, and if the only type of fermented food that somebody has access to, either because that's what their store sells or what their budget allows, comes in plastic, still eat the sauerkraut, like still eat the fermented food, right? This is not a, a race or a competition to perfection. Um, this is also something that I see parroted a lot on social um, is the sort of positioning of health as something that only like affluent people have access to. And I have a real problem with that because uh, the people that are most disproportionately exposed to toxic chemicals are people that are lower income, that are black or brown and living in disadvantaged communities. They often have those higher exposures. So um, a big part of doing this work and having this conversation is to make accessible recommendations. And again, keep that sort of balanced thread. But yeah, so get rid of your plastic uh, food storage containers, then look at all the plastic items in your home and start phasing those out. Um, if that happens over time, if that takes six months or a year for people to kind of work through that process, fine. Um, the important thing to remember when it comes to these toxic exposures that we're getting every day is that 
It's the long-term exposure that matters more than our short-term exposure. So it's okay if you have to keep using the plastic that you have for the next month or six months. When we're looking at multiple years of exposure and use, that's where the kind of red flags come up. That's great. And what a great reminder. On the topic of plastics, there's this whole category that you've written about extensively. extensively, And it's the plastics that are a part of our normal day-to-day life that actually make it easier to do things. And when it comes to the kitchen, they're going to be things like blenders, uh, food yes. processors, yeah. et cetera. You had this great post recently. I'll share it on the screen over here. It's called What to Do About the Plastics We Can't Avoid. And uh, you know, slight spoiler alert, there are things that we can do because these tools, these things that we use, obviously plastics have made the world a better place in many aspects of life. Yeah. One being, you know, ease of use in sort of the kitchen. In the medical field, of course, we're super reliant on plastics. But again, it's about minimizing our direct exposure. So when it comes to these plastics that we can avoid, the blender, the food processor that are there, what's most important for people to know? And then what are the suggestions and recommendations you have? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing that I would encourage people to remember is the things that increase the rate at which chemicals migrate out. So that's heat oil, acidity, abrasion. So let's talk about a food processor and something like a high speed Vitamix, Blendtec, whatever, these like, you know, multiple hundred dollar blenders. First of all, if you're spending multiples of hundreds of dollars on a blender, you're probably somebody who's a foodie, who is interested in health. You're not throwing, you know, ho-hos and Twinkies in a blender and saying, calling it like, you know, a gourmet soup. So you're not putting junk food in these high price point blenders. Um, And so we still want to use these kitchen appliances if it helps to facilitate cooking at home, which is a great way to minimize exposure to PFAS, for example, and other chemicals um, because we have more control. And so we still want to use these, but we want to consider heat, oil, acidity, and abrasion. And so if we're looking at like grinding nuts or grinding something that's hard and abrasive, that is something that, you know, we might want to consider. Just, you don't have to not do it, just be aware of it. Um, I think the thing that we don't want to do, and I see this a lot, um, is don't go making your bulletproof coffee in your blender. Don't go putting a hot coffee with fat, that's heat and oil, in Mm. your blender and blending it up and then drinking it. You don't need to do that. You can buy a really inexpensive, um, like uh, immersion uh, coffee frother. They cost like less than $10. Um, Coffee shops use these to just put a nice froth on your coffee. Um, A simple switch switch like that. Um, Similarly, if you're making a pureed soup, don't put hot soup into your blender. Either let the soup cool or use a, a stainless steel immersion blender. These are 20 or $30. So um, we just want to avoid using, and I I think, uh, using um, uh, those types of appliances, like a plastic blender and a plastic food processor, in that way. So for example, I love pesto. I make pesto a lot. I will use my food processor to grind the the pine nuts and the garlic and and the basil. But when it comes to putting the olive oil in, I actually will scrape the food processor bowl move it into another bowl, and then I'll add the olive oil because I just don't need, it's just unnecessary. Also, it makes your uh, cleaning a lot easier because you can just rinse it out. (laughs) So, um, but there's just small behaviors like that. Um, And then at the end of the day, you know, we don't want to be putting these plastic uh, uh, appliances in the dishwasher. Dishwashing detergent is very um, caustic. And it's literally designed to dissolve crusted on food. And so if there is no food crusted on, um, it's just really, really, really hard on plastics. We see plastics that have been in the dishwasher for a long time and they're foggy and scratched up. Why? Abrasion. Abrasion. So the surfaces are abraded. That just is increasing the uh, rate of these chemicals that are migrating out. So we just kind of have to care for these plastics um, a little bit differently. So hand wash them, use a soft sponge, don't scrub the inside of your food processor or blender. There are some companies like Vitamix does make a stainless steel carafe for 
their blenders. It's like a $200, $250 um, replacement carafe. So it's, again, not cheap. Um, and if somebody doesn't need a super, you know, ultra horsepower uh, a blender, you can still find blenders that have glass, uh, a glass carafe. So, um, you know, we just, again, we just want to kind of behave differently around these materials. That's great. No, super helpful. And it's even an important reminder for people like myself. I am lucky, you know, enough to have somebody who helps, you know, come once a week or twice a week to come and clean a little bit in the house. I'm you know, busy. I'm running a bunch of companies. I'm trying to do my podcast. I want to put my time in that area. And I've forgot to tell this individual that, oh my gosh, you know, the Vitamix, it'd be great if we can actually just wash by hand. Or even sometimes when I make my wife a smoothie or she makes me a smoothie, it's sometimes just easy to think, oh, we're just going to dump it in the you know dishwasher. Again, like yeah. you said, it's not the end of the world, but as no. we're on our mission to minimize our overall exposure to in totality limit our exposure to these environmental toxins, little tiny steps go a long way, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and there's another category of things as we go around the kitchen and we're looking at a few different areas. Another category is, you know, so many people not only use cleaning products in their kitchen, but they often store a lot of their cleaning products in the kitchen as well. So that's where a lot of our storage ends up being. There's been an explosion of sort of green cleaners, better alternatives, natural cleaners that are out there. And I think that a lot of people feel like, okay, I'm buying things that are at least uh, maybe a little bit better and a step in the right direction. But what's important for us to know about cleaning products, especially in the kitchen when it comes to reducing our environmental exposure? Yeah, I think, you know, look, we all want to have a clean kitchen, myself included. Um, and, you know, for a very long time, and like you said, things have shifted for a very long time. If you looked at the marketing around cleaning products, it was always, you know, industrial strength, super strong, new and improved. Like it was this, um, you know, pull out the big guns and kill everything. It kills 99.99% of bacteria, <clears throat> excuse me. And so like, that's the marketing angle is that like, it kills everything. And the first thing I want to say when it comes to household cleaners is unless somebody is like immunocompromised, that degree of sanitation and disinfection is typically not necessary, even in a kitchen. Like, yes, we want to clean our cutting boards that had chicken and meat and, you know, raw, raw meats on them. Yes, we want to do that. Um, yes, we want to, you know, make sure that we don't have, you know, mold and bacteria and stuff. But as a general rule, um, we don't need to bring out the big guns to disinfect the hell out of everything. It's just unnecessary. Um, and, you know, we do have some research that suggests that overdoing it when it comes to disinfection um, and sanita uh, sanitizing uh, surfaces um, could possibly be a detriment to our health. And so there is, a, you know, it's we don't have conclusive sort of data or stance on that. Um, but, you know, we don't need a lot of the cleaners. Um, additionally, when you go to the grocery store and you go down that cleaning aisle, um, there's like a whole aisle. There's like hundreds of products there. The formulas of those products are all kind of fundamentally the same. They're not so dramatically different. Like nothing bad would happen if you used a bathroom cleaner in your kitchen or vice versa. <laughs> you know, like nothing's going to happen to you. It's okay. Um, in terms of like not crossing any weird, invisible marketing lines. Um, and so to that point, we can use, we can one, simplify our cleaning routine. You know, you average American, you go under their kitchen sink and there's like 28 bottles of stuff under there. And each one has a separate job. This one's for the toilet and that one's for the sink and this one's for the tub and that one's for the counters. And it's like, it's marketing. It's a waste of money because it's unnecessary. So one, again, we can save money by just simplifying our cleaning routine. Um, two, in terms of the toxic chemicals, a lot of cleaning products, whether they're using, you know, a heavy uh, handed with fragrances or they have ammonia or they have other volatile organic compounds, um, a lot of these uh, cleaners contain solvents, which are carcinogens. They have uh, and release a lot of toxic chemicals into the home, into the air that we breathe. We have to remember that um, when you 
when chemicals are released into our home, they don't just evaporate and vanish. They're molecules. They're like physical molecules. They don't just go away. They actually settle in our homes. They settle in our house dust. Um, and so this is, you know, one of the one of the sort of free and easy recommendations I often make for people is just open your windows in order to help some of those chemicals dissipate. And so these volatile chemicals, um, these carcinogens, these endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals like the fragrance uh, mixtures um, aren't helping anybody. They aren't adding anything to anybody's health and they are linked to respiratory issues, to endocrine disruption, to hormone uh, related endpoints. Um, they can be linked to cancers. There's also no requirement that all of the ingredients on those products be disclosed. So the consumer is a little bit kind of taking people's word for it as it pertains to like the label. Um, and, and that's not really fair, I think, for consumers to kind of be in a marketplace where we're just like, it's that they have to um, accept the trust us, it's safe kind of marketing line, because um, why would I trust you? Why would I trust you? You've given me no reason to do so for, for a lot of these companies um, or industries. And so for cleaning products, I think it's, uh, you know, we don't need the big guns. Um, we do want to be careful of all of these um, fragrances and volatile compounds, um, for, certainly for anybody living in a home that has um, uh, any kind of respiratory issues or asthma. These can be re uh, respiratory and airway irritants. Um, certainly for anybody who's living in a home with um, anybody uh, on the autism spectrum who might have um, some uh, uh, sort of sensory issues, right? Because this is a constant exposure to fragrances and to chemicals that might be triggering to them that other people are just kind of like whatever about. Um, the good thing is we don't, uh, there are many, many, many inexpensive, some are more expensive um, cleaning products that don't have as a as a as a point of their company, don't have any of these really concerning toxic chemicals. They don't have fragrances. They don't release toxic VOCs. They don't have any fragrance at all, um, and they're not caustic. Uh, and and I think if we can, we want to move towards these things. Um, if we don't, we don't need, for example, like a scrubbing bubbles. Right? I think of that product. Um, I haven't actually shopped for anything in any of these cleaning aisles in like 20 years. So I'm dating myself with a scrubbing bubbles reference. I don't even know if that's still a product that's for sale. But in the 80s, scrubbing bubbles commercials on TV were like a big deal. So, um, But we don't need to use a product like that. That's a time saver for sure. We can literally just use baking soda as a mild abrasive or something like Bon Ami, which is another non-toxic um, mild abrasive, you can get a canister of Bon Ami usually for like $1.29. It's really inexpensive. It's a basic all-purpose abrasive. Some people certainly can go the vinegar and baking soda route for cleaning. I don't like that because um, I hate the smell of vinegar. <laughs> um, and vinegar acetic acid is an irritant. So for people that have respiratory issues, going the, all, the other end of the extreme of the all-natural Maybe that's not it either. But thankfully, like you said, there's been this explosion of better brands um, and safer cleaners. Um, I think as it pertains specifically to the household cleaner conversation, but certainly um, similar in lo lots of other facets of the toxicity conversation, things exist on a spectrum of like good, better, best. And I don't think we all, like if people can afford best, this goes to your like um, a splurge cookware titanium uh, topic earlier, if people can afford a splurge, great, do Branch Basics. It's $50 a bottle of their concentrate. It's a really great um, all-purpose cleaner that does laundry and toilets and kitchen sinks and everything um, all at once. And so we, um, we have those options, but we don't have to splurge on our household cleaners. There are better options out there. No, I think Branch Basics is great. And I know you're a big fan of them too. Well, yeah, I love their stuff. We'll link to your uh, page. I think you have like some coupon codes and other recommendations of uh, individuals that are looking for like household cleaners. And you have a whole shop section on your website, which I found very helpful. So we'll link to that okay. in the show notes and people can find that. You know, one of the areas, you know, zooming in, zooming out that we're in particular on this podcast, we're also sort of sounding the alarm on is that we are actually dealing with, uh, you know, a global 
fertility crisis and in mm -hmm. particular in that category. And there's a lot of nuances to it. When it comes to men, we've seen a major decline in sperm count and the health of the sperm. And in some instances, maybe even the you know health, which also would include motility. And that's yeah. one of the things that's obviously playing a part in this. You know, what do we know about environmental toxins and potentially a lot of these ones that are lurking in our kitchen, you know, could some of those things be impacting or contributing to some of the environmental toxins that we know that are harming, uh, you know, healthy levels of sperm in men? Yeah. I mean, certainly those, the, the, I'll keep going back to the big ones, the, the phthalates, the bisphenols, the PFAS chemicals. And I keep bringing those up for a reason, for a couple of reasons. One, because people possibly more likely have heard of BPA. They've heard of phthalates. They've heard of PFAS. But also when we look at the human biomonitoring studies that are looking for levels of toxic chemicals in the U.S. population, for example, 93% of people, this is based on data from like a decade ago, so the number could be higher, 93% um, of people have metabolites of bisphenols in their body. 97 or 98% have um, levels of phthalates in their bodies. Um, both of those chemicals, by the way, are non-persistent. That means that they don't build up in our bodies. They actually have a very short half-life. They get metabolized within 6 to 12 hours. That means we pee them out. Um, the reason why the levels are so constant, 93, 98%, is because we have so many exposure sources and we're taking them in faster than our bodies can break them down. So we're always, it's, I, I always use the, I love Lucy on the chocolate conveyor belt <laughs> um, as the example, like we just don't know what to do with them. So our bodies are just hanging on, stuffing them in our shirts and in our mouths, so to speak. Um, uh, and, and PFAS, we know that um, 99 plus percent of people have PFAS in their bodies. So I keep going back to those chemicals because they're ubiquitous. We all have exposure and we all have them in us to some degree. So we do have research showing that um, among, certainly among other things, diet, nutrition, obesity, smoking, um, that these toxic chemicals can in fact um, affect fertility. And some of that can actually happen um, when a, a, a person is in utero and exposure is happening in utero. So um, if uh, I'll use this as an example, um, if a woman is pregnant or when a woman is pregnant and she has a female baby can also, it doesn't really matter, can be a, a, a male fetus. Um, and she is exposed to a toxic chemical. There's actually three generations of people that are being exposed. The pregnant woman, her developing fetus and the germ cells and st stem cells that will become sperm and ovaries for that fetus are all being exposed at the same time. And so when we see effects in individuals population wide, like the sperm decline, yes, we can attribute some of this to like all the same lifestyle stuff that we talked about earlier. Those the opposite, I guess, the the not eating well and the not taking care of yourself and, and smoking and all that stuff. We know that that has a, a contributor, contributory effect, but so too do these toxic chemicals um, that we're exposed to ubiquitously. And if we had an exposure in utero, which we all have, right, we're all affected. And then we also get our own exposures throughout our lifetime compounded on top of that. Over time, this is going to lead to a significant issue, both in chronic disease and lowered fertility. Um, I don't know, Drew, if you've ever read um, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale um, that was published, I think, in 1982 or 1983. I read it as a kid, and then I read it again a number of years ago. Um, do you know the premise of that story? I'm very familiar with the premise. I have not read the book, but of course, you know, the TV show that ultimately yeah. became part of it. I've seen it, but yes, um, please continue. Yeah. So the origin story, and I don't remember that this is referenced in the TV series, but in the book specifically, the reason for declined fertility, which is why the whole forced reproduction storyline exists in that book was because of toxic chemicals. Wow. Wow. So like... <laughs> You know, like it's it's a little prescient, unfortunately, um, <laughs> to have been written in the 1980s. And so, um, you know, we do we do have enough data 
Certainly we need more like always, but we do have enough data that these environmental exposures are playing an enormous role in, um, in both male for male uh, side fertility issues, as well as female side fertility issues with egg implantation and increased risk of miscarriage and early onset menopause. Like there's lots of different factors, but definitely as it pertains to sperm count, um, environmental chemicals are something that are contributing. And so if some somebody is in a relationship or just trying to, to, to have a child and um, it's, it's that much more important for that population to really prioritize lowering their exposures, both from a improving fertility uh, uh, outcome and just for having a healthy offspring, for having mm. a healthy child at the end. And not just immediately healthy, like 10 fingers, 10 toes, hearts pumping well, but <laughs> right. a long-term health, right? So there is a, an area, uh, a sort of a subset of research in the environmental health space um, uh, that references the fetal origin of adult disease. And it's exploring are the origins of cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease when people hit their 40s and 50s, could that have been a product of something that they experienced in utero? And the research is saying like, well, yeah, in some instances, yes, we do have a lot of research that suggests that prenatal exposures are, in fact, a, a contributing factor to adult disease. So there's lots of reasons during that vulnerable time of uh, preconception and, and planning and trying to get pregnant to focus on environmental exposures. You know, zooming out for a second, and we still have a couple more categories that we want to get to, um, but zooming out for a second. If we had to prioritize, right, top one, two, three, and maybe even four things in the kitchen, especially that deserve our attention and are higher sources of potential toxic exposure, right? What should we be prioritizing top line? Yeah. Food, water are always going to be first. Food first, water second. Maybe those are sort of take equal footing. And then it's all the other things that we've talked about, about our cookware and our plastics. Um, I think that if we just did those four, we'd be good. So let's talk about food and then we'll come back to water. What are the connections between environmental toxins or toxic exposure and food? How do you look at it as somebody who's deep in this space? Yeah, I mean, the primary lens is going to be pesticides and herbicides uh, used in conventional agriculture versus um, the, the way that uh, organic agriculture um, is, is produced. And so we do know that there's pesticide and herbicide residues on conventional produce. We have seen this. There's lots of data that shows this. Um, the sort of prevailing wisdom um, is that the low levels of exposure are no big deal. We have thresholds. These are regulated and all of the residues that are showing up on our fruits and vegetables um, and our meats and, and dairy products are well below the threshold. And I can come back to like why that doesn't really mean anything for me with an understanding of how chemicals interact with our, our biology. So on the one hand, like we are getting, uh, food is our primary exposure outside of occupational exposures to pesticides and herbicides. Um, we have lots of data that uh, supports this. And we also know there are multiple studies, at least five or six, they have all come to the same conclusion, <clears throat> is that um, by prioritizing a mostly organic diet, which I know is a very privileged thing for people to have access to, and not everybody has access to that, um, but prioritizing a mostly organic diet, we can reduce the circulating levels of these pesticides and herbicides by 80 to 90% in a three to five day window. Wow. That's huge. They're really short. And that's because they're non-persistent, right? They don't build up in the body. So it's the same concept as those BPAs and the phthalates is they're not persistent. And so if we just give our body the opportunity to do what it does, which is metabolize and excrete these toxic chemicals, we can have a, a huge impact just across the board. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, that is a meaningful exposure source to these pesticides and herbicides, which in and of themselves are linked to everything from cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease and cancers to uh, behavioral issues and developmental issues in children, birth defects in children. So like 
again, every or every organ system um, has has some um, endpoint that can be affected by these pesticides and herbicides. They're neurotoxic, uh, specifically to children. And even if, even if the amounts that were in our food were like no big deal, no health effects, we cannot ignore the people that are occupationally exposed to much higher levels of these pesticides and herbicides as part of their job. The people that grow and package food. And who are those people? Typically, black and brown people that don't have access to health care. So it is not okay for us to just say, well, I'm not affected because it doesn't matter uh, because, my, because I'm protected, because other people are not. And I think that we have to consider the environmental justice lens of this conversation. So I often will push that back on people that argue that the low amount of pesticides that we get in our food, on our tomatoes and on our lettuce are no big deal because you cannot argue that those high levels of occupational uh, exposures are also no big deal. That's an important point. Thank you for bringing that up. Have you seen any data about how ultra processed foods in particular can end up being concentrated sources of pesticides. I feel like I saw some data that was out there, but I wasn't able to reference back to the paper. And the theory and the idea was that at every stage, since ultra processed foods have so many different areas of interaction, processing, et cetera, we're not talking about processed foods, almond butter, you know, things like that. We're talking about ultra processed foods, which have so many stages that there's more likelihood that there's pesticide exposure along the way. Have you seen anything like that? I haven't seen anything specifically about concentrated pesticides, but I do know that, for example, if we think about an ultra processed food and we think about the factory setting, um, you know, there's whatever the food is, it's a puree, it's a, it's got to get cooked, it's got to get chopped, it's got to get moved from over here to over there. The amount of plastic that that food encounters in its manufacturing process is high at every point along the manufacturing and packaging process plastics are playing a role. Many of those plastics can be coated with PFAS chemicals. Why? Mm. Because they're, um, it renders the, um, uh, the plastic as nonstick. And so their food won't be stuck to the conveyor belt or to the tube. Um, even if we think about something like dairy, which is very low processed, right? It's not an ultra processed foods. When a cow is being milked, what is the milk passing through to get from the cow to the um, storage container? A soft, flexible plastic tube that has phthalates in it. And so one, like all food that is processed is going to have some degree of phthalates or other plasticizer chemicals, bisphenols, PFAS chemicals. And this is um, an unfortunate and un currently an unavoidable exposure source until we change food manufacturing. And there's not even a movement to do that at this point, right? Um, there are what are referred to as FCMs or food contact materials. And there is research exploring, hey, maybe we need to revisit some of these materials. But I think probably when we're looking at ultra processed foods, the, they are going to very likely have a higher sort of toxic load because it's going through so many different steps and stages in the uh, processing uh, process for mm, to be redundant. That makes total sense. You know, you mentioned water, and we're going to jump into that in a second, but I actually want to just take a moment to talk about you and your background. Tell our audience, yeah. how did you become so passionate about being a defender of not just you and your family, but coming out publicly and sounding the alarm on many of these hidden sources of toxins that we're all being exposed to. Yeah, it sort of, it, I say it sort of happened on accident and the sort of is a thumbtack. So I was always somebody in my youth that was, you know, kind of um, counter culture. I grew up in the punk rock, indie rock, hardcore music scene in the like late 80s, early 90s. Um, that was what I was always into. So it was kind of a, um, a F the man kind of vibe, <laughs> if you will. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I, I uh, professionally, I took a, a different path. I spent many years in a, you know, stock photography industry um, unrelated to this, but I was always a foodie. I was always obsessed with food and nutrition. Um, I was uh, attending like mushroom growing workshops, like right out of uh, high school and into college. Like I was the farmer's market person. I was the pick your own organic produce person. Like that was just who I was. Um, and it wasn't until many years after um, I was in this other career that I was like, you know, maybe I can do something with this obsession that I have with food and nutrition and just sort of this this space of, of wellness. Um, and so I uh, uh, went back to school to become a health coach. I started doing that work, health coaching. Um, this felt like a bigger contribution, like a better, more positive contribution to the world than like sitting in a fluorescent light cubicle selling stock photographs to book publishers. Like that wasn't it for me. And no shade to that industry. It just wasn't it for me. Um, and so I started working um, in health coaching and helping people who were struggling with some metabolic issues who wanted to lose weight. And um, at no point was toxicity at this point really on my radar. Uh, but I had a couple of clients that were really, really compliant. They did all of the things that I knew to make recommendations on in regards to weight loss. They ate better, they moved, they managed their stress, they slept well, all those sort of basic foundation uh, pieces. Um, but nothing happened. They didn't lose any weight. And they were frustrated and I was frustrated. And so I started digging into the literature around resistant weight loss. Like, what am I missing? I'm obviously missing something. And it was sort of through that exploration that I discovered this topic of obesogens, obesogenic chemicals, chemicals that can alter our metabolism in ways that can lead to increased weight gain, to insulin resistance, to diabetes, to obesity. Um, and I, it was like a record scratch for me because I'd spent, you know, the previous 10 or 15 years reading everything I could get my hands on in regards to health. I'd spent, you know, a year going back to school to become a health coach. Nobody was talking about these obesogenic chemicals, these chemicals that we were exposed to that were linked to metabolic issues. And it just was this big kind of aha moment for me where I said, this is fascinating. Like, I just wanna do this. I just wanna talk about this. I wanna learn about this. I wanna research this. And that's what I did. I spent a couple of years, I was living in New York City at the time, the New York Academy of Sciences is there, the Children's Environmental Health Center um, run by Phil Landrigan, who is a, a absolute um, you know, legend in the environmental toxicity space. He was instrumental in helping get lead out of gasoline in the 1970s. And so these were the people that I was learning from as I was attending you know, the conferences and symposiums and lectures. Um, and I did this for a couple of years before I realized I need to share this. I can't just know this for myself. And so um, in 2012, I started teaching the colleagues in the health coaching space um, about this. And then it expanded to nutritionists and then nurses and naturopathic doctors and medical doctors. And I've been doing this now for 12, going on 13 years. And it's been really exciting to do this work. Um, the interesting hitch in this story um, is two things. One, um, a couple of years ago, I guess about six years ago, I went back to my childhood home. Um, it was my dad's 80th birthday. So I went back to home and, uh, you know, when, as an adult, you go back to your childhood home and you like poke around at all the things that were left behind in your bedroom that you didn't care enough about to take with you in your adult life. Well, I found in the closet, a, um, box of index cards uh, from a paper I wrote in high school on a vegetarian diet. This was in 1992. And I randomly pulled an index card. There's a photo of it somewhere on my Instagram, but it's like from a way back. And it was a quote. And this was bibliography when we had to do a written bibliography on index cards. <laughs> um, and it was just a quote about, you know, more and more people were turning to a vegetarian diet in part because of the toxic chemicals. And I was like, what? <laughs> wait, what? It just, yeah. So like that was a bit of an aha moment. The other thing is um, not ironically um, or ironically, I guess it depends on how you look at it. Um, my father has worked in the nonstick coding industry for probably <laughs> the last 30 years. And so when I was in 
college, long before any of this professionally was on my radar, I was emailing my father articles about nonstick cookware and um, what's called Teflon toxicosis or polymer fume fever, which is when birds, the typical canary in the coal mine, birds have a really sensitive respiratory system and they can literally just drop dead if they're exposed to fumes um, from nonstick cookware. So bird owners generally know you're not supposed to have any nonstick in the house. And I was sending these articles to my dad, who was then forwarding them to the president of the company. Um, so I've been a thorn in the side of this industry since I was in my early 20s. So okay. it's kind of like, I don't know how else I could have done anything different than this. It was, it was, it was destiny in a way. I think so. <laughs> I mean, it's, I don't know if I believe in destiny, but I definitely <laughs> feel like, huh. I guess there is some degree of some degree of something like that because I could not fathom doing anything else. Mm, powerful story. Thank you for giving the background and you know just a little plug for you know your website and all the great work that you do. We have a link in the show notes. You know they can visit you at lauraadler.com. We have the link in the show notes and you have a ton of incredible courses, you do some consulting, there's a bunch of free resources that are there. And again, my favorite section is you have a shop section yeah. and you can go through on that shop section. You can go to skincare, makeup, hair, hair care, you know, menstrual care, household cleaners, cookware, which we talked about earlier, mattresses, books, etc. And you can find all sorts of resources that are there when people are just like, look, you've done the work. Just tell me what to buy. I don't have hours and hours necessarily to research, but I know it's an issue. What can I get? So thank you for making such a friendly website. And I really encourage people to check it out. Okay. I want to come back to the water story. I asked you, what are the, what are the handful of areas to prioritize? And you said, while cookware is important, and we started there because my community has a lot of questions about it and plastics are important. We went to that next, you know, it's really food, which we just covered, and it's water. You know, there's been so much conversation about water, and there's a lot more awareness that's there. And yet, I know that the awareness hasn't, you know, gotten high enough yet because I still go to people's homes and I see them either drinking through the tap, right? Just traditional tap water, even in places like here in Los Angeles, New York City. Or they're using things like, uh, you know, uh, Brita filter, not to pick on that company. And I know they've come out with some other, you know, slightly better options than their sort of standard one, which is mostly focused on just improving taste by focusing on just like chlorine, right? Yeah. Tell us about why those solutions of just drinking tap water and relying on a traditional sort of basic filter why are they not getting to the root of how bad this problem is? Yeah. And I'll also add bottled water because a ton of people are oh, just so going true. to Costco and buying absolute, you know, like a pallet worth of bottled water to drink, thinking that it's better. And it's bottled it's water in plastic. Yeah. It's in not specific. better. It's just not better. Um, yeah. But yeah. And in some so, cases, it actually could be worse. Absolutely. Yes. So, you know, look, if you live in a developed country, um, water in countries like ours is going to be better <clears throat> from the standpoint of we're unlikely to develop <clears throat> dysentery or cholera, these communicable diseases. We've conquered that, right? And so our water is considered clean from that sort of bacterial contaminant perspective. But that doesn't mean it's clean. <laughs> It just means that it's safer from that perspective. And so, and, and we achieved that through things like disinfection. So disinfect, disinfecting the water through chlorination or chlorination. And these are, this is just widespread. There's very few, I think there's two cities in the United States that have a pass in terms of disinfection because their source water is very good. Um, but the rest of the country and the developed world is um, disinfecting their water. And that has pros and cons. The pro, we don't have cholera in our water. We're not having uh, uh, outbreaks of dysentery. Although I did think, I did think, uh, I think I heard something in LA actually, that there was a spread of dysentery. Yikes. I think <laughs> it was maybe, maybe it was a while ago. Anyway. Um, so, you know, it is clean from that perspective. That's the pro. The con is that we have now these disinfection chemicals in 
the water system. And they uh, don't just evaporate, right? They don't just disappear. Um, and those disinfection byproducts, uh, uh, these disinfection chemicals can react with organic matter that's just naturally present in the water and create what are called secondary byproducts or disinfection byproducts. And these are carcinogens. These are highly toxic. And so we have that in our water. We also have um, uh, uh, chemicals, unregulated chemicals. We have PFAS in our water. We have can have heavy metals in our water. Flint, Michigan is a really good example of, of that instance. Um, there's all kinds of you know, pharmaceuticals and plastics. Um, there's tons of different chemicals. There's been over 300 that have been measured through the federal agencies that are monitoring this. And the challenge here is that um, the, our federal drinking water standards only regulate about 90 different contaminants. And so we have hundreds more that are actually in the water that are not regulated, which means that they're technically legally allowed to be there. They're not violating any rule because there is no rule. And even of the roughly 90, 91 contaminants that are regulated under the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act, many municipalities are in violation of those standards regularly. So just because the standard exists doesn't mean that these chemicals aren't showing up in the water. Additionally, the levels that are permitted under the Safe Drinking Water Act are not health levels. They're not the level at which um, a, a health uh, a epidemiologists and experts are saying, ah, that level is safe. It is a negotiation between health experts and infrastructure experts that say, we don't have the budget to require every water municipality, every water service system in the United States to meet this standard because their ability to filter out arsenic or microplastics or PFAS, for example, is costly. And if you are talking about an impoverished city that in an impoverished state, where's the money going to come from? to optimize their water filtration system at the city level to meet that standard. This is actually what's happening right now with the PFAS regulations. The federal government is proposing extremely strict uh, levels of two PFAS, uh, PFOA and PFOS, um, and a couple of other ones that are slightly less strict. But the, the level is basically zero, right? It's basically zero. And now the question that that, um, uh, uh, regulation is proposed, it hasn't fully passed yet. Um, the question is, how are cities going to meet this regulation? Where's the money coming from? With, without federal support. Without federal support, right? Without federal support, where's the money coming from? Um, I just saw an article that um, Florida is one of the first states that is going to be implementing um, a PFAS filtration process. Um, I don't know if it was just in a specific city, but it was like, Oh yeah, it's going to cost the population of Florida like you know two hundred billion dollars over the next twenty years. You know, like that's a lot. <laughs> um, and so you know we have this um, water system that has a tremendous amount of harmful chemicals. Um, some uh, cities will fluoridate their water. That's another uh, contaminant of concern. Some cities don't fluoridate their water, but they're getting their water from a uh, uh, aquifer that has fluorine in it because fluorine is an element. It's natural. Same thing with arsenic. So we have different varying levels of arsenic. I live in New Mexico. Um, parts of uh, this state have high levels of arsenic in the geography. And so the water here can have higher levels of arsenic. Arsenic is one of the most toxic metals. It's linked to skin cancers and, and, and other serious, serious health effects, metabolic disease, diabetes. Um, and it's challenging to filter out. So, and it's not going to get filtered out uh, necessarily well at our, our utilities. And so this is why tap water, again, it's not terrible as it pertains to bacterial issues, but it's not good as it pertains to the contaminants that are present. And so this is where um, people will often turn to bottled water. But we have to know that bottled water, for the most part, is just municipal tap water. Sometimes it's undergone a little bit of treatment, um, but what people are paying is, I think it's a 9,000% premium 
some I think that was the figure that I that I remember reading. Now, like, why? Why? It's not better. And then to your point, um, bottled water very often has microplastics, and now we know nanoplastics as well. And so those are another exposure source that brings us to then filtration. And I think probably the number one question I get in my business and on my social media particularly is, hey, Laura, what kind of filter, water filter should I get? And I cannot answer that question. <laughs> Uh, because like everything, it depends. What's your budget? What contaminants are in your water? What are your health concerns? How much space do you have in your kitchen? I lived in New York City for 10 years and I had 24 inches of counter space. There was no room for any kind of countertop filter. I was a renter. I couldn't install an under sink filter. So I had a Brita filter, right? And so maybe it wasn't the best, but it was the best for the situation I was in at the time. So there is no perfect filter or filtration technology that will work for everyone. What we need to figure out are what are the contaminants that are in our water in the first place? And then we can make our filter buying decision based on that, right? It would be like going to a doctor and saying, well, and, and them saying, well, we're just gonna give you a bunch of medications. We don't know what's wrong with you yet, but we're just gonna give you a bunch of medications. Okay, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. I, I do agree with that big picture, you know, the personalization. The challenge is sometimes even getting accurate information. And then the part that we didn't talk about is sort of that last mile sort of impact. Yeah. You know, the pipes in your building, how yep. old it is, the contamination from, you know, the water leaving the municipality to go to your place. So in a way, unless we're doing a home test, which I feel is kind of out of reach for a lot of individuals, they're not yeah. that costly. It's more about the time and the effort that goes into it than being able to read the report. Yeah. You know, I guess I'm sort of in a friendly way trying to push back and say, yeah. is it actually truly necessary for us to know how contaminated our water is here in the United States? Or can we give general recommendations either based on price point or based on sort of, you know, you're single, you have a family, you have this thing. So just in a healthy way, I'm just genuinely asking. Yes. You don't yeah, have to yeah, agree yeah. with me. No, no, no. I, I mean, I don't disagree with you. I, it's like on most topics in this space, it's a yes and, right? It's a yes and, or it's a, it depends. So yes, it, as, a, as a baseline, any filtration is better than no filtration, period, end of story. So That's if somebody one. can, yeah, if somebody, if all somebody can afford is a Brita, great, do that. Get that, just change the filter frequently because the amount of um, carbon in that cartridge is so small, it's going to get exhausted very quickly. So you just want to change it frequently. So baseline, any filtration is better than no filtration. Um, a step up from there, if you don't want to get your water tested, if you don't care necessarily to dig into the minutia, but you just want something that's better than nothing, and you want something better than a, something like a, like a pitcher filter, um, then you're going to be looking at some type of multi-stage under sink filter. This is uh, re what's referred to as point of use. So unless your kitchen sink itself um, has lead soldering, um, it doesn't matter what's in the house and in the plumbing from the street to the house because the point of use, it's getting filtered right where it's coming out of the faucet. So that is the last entry or the last, uh, you know, sort of, place that it is encountering anything is the filter itself. So um, a multi-stage filter, which is usually, you know, one of the stages might have a pre-filter and then there's a carbon filter of some sort. And maybe there's a third component that has some other type of media that is specific for certain types of metals or certain type of chemicals. Um, then that is going to, again, it's going to produce even better water for you. Um, you still might be missing some things. And the reason why I think this matters um, specifically for people who might be dealing with some type of chronic health issue is that, uh, let's just use fluoride, for example. So we know fluoride um, is thyroid suppressing. So if somebody is dealing with autoimmune, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, or some other type of thyroid issue, and they just go out and they buy some generic three-stage under sink filter, and they're like, cool, I did a great thing but that filter doesn't remove fluoride because fluoride is notoriously difficult to remove. Yeah, okay, you're taking out all those other chemicals, but you're still exposing yourself every day 
through a chemical that we know can have thyroid suppressing effects. So and a question on that. Yeah. A question on that. To sorry to interrupt. Would a typical, you know, when you're saying these multi-stage under the sink, is another name for that also reverse osmosis? Or you're no. saying that some of them could be and some of them may not be reverse osmosis. Yes. So reverse osmosis is a very specific type of filtration. Reverse osmosis will also have multi-stages, right? Because the membrane in a reverse osmosis filter is very delicate. And so you have to make sure that you're kind of removing the things that might damage that filter before the water gets to the filter. So all reverse osmosis units will have one or two stages prior to going through the membrane. Um, to me, reverse osmosis is a last resort filter. And I say that because um, primarily, so reverse osmosis will remove the most of uh, contaminants of any type of filtration system. So if somebody's just like, my, my water is awful, I don't want to have to go into the minutia and I want the best of the best, they're going to you know, maybe spend a little bit more, a couple hundred dollars more. Reverse osmosis systems aren't exorbitantly expensive. And they might get that. Now, there's two downsides to that, one more important than the other, um, and that's a little subjective. So one is it is removing all of the beneficial minerals, uh, the magnesiums and calciums in our water that give our water a taste, a nice taste. Um, and we don't want to long term drink um, this sort of deionized, stripped uh, water that doesn't have any minerals in it. Many reverse osmosis systems will have a final stage that essentially adds minerals back to the water that were removed. And if a system has that, great, you're good to go. The other issue and the one that's more concerning to me is reverse osmosis systems are wasteful. Um, the process of producing, say, a gallon of drinkable reverse osmosis filtered water can sometimes take two to three to four gallons of water to produce one water to drink. So that means three to four gallons are going down the drain. We are fast approaching a um, time on this planet where water scarcity is going to be an enormous problem and is an, going to be an increasing problem. I live in the desert, so water conservation is a big deal. Um, so for me, getting a reverse osmosis system is, um, is, is a worst case scenario, meaning my water has contaminants that can only be removed through this technology. Okay, fine. But I think it's overkill for a lot of people. So, so what kind of filter do you use? I live in New Mexico. There's arsenic in my water sometimes. So I do have a reverse osmosis system. Yeah, got it. And I don't like it, but it's what yeah, I use. Totally. And I feel the same way. You know, I am not happy that I'm using, you know, something that I use reverse osmosis. I've used it for years. Yeah. Uh, I, I am concerned about water conservation and I'm more concerned about, you know, my family's health is just the honest truth yeah, right? sure, and living course. in Los Angeles and knowing that things like, uh, hexachromium five yeah. or six, whatever yeah, it's called. Six. Yeah. Right. And all these other things are lurking in there. You know, I have to believe that by me, my wife, our future baby, my family that visits guests, et cetera, by making sure that we have access to, you know, clean water and people, you know, raising awareness about how important this is you know, that we will ultimately, I am a techno optimist and I do believe that technology used yeah. in the right way will help us solve a lot of these solutions. So I do understand that, you know, there's no best option that's there, but for a lot of people who are just like, Hey, look, I have some resources. What should I do? Yeah. I often default to reverse osmosis because we all live in big cities with all sorts of crazy stuff that's in the water. Yeah, I mean, it's and that's and that's fine. You know, again, if if at the end of the day you're getting people to filter their water in a in a comprehensive capacity, great, keep, keep doing that. Um, and again, this is one of those things where the onus should not be on the individual to have to do this, <clears throat> but currently it is because yeah. we're not going to solve this problem. I mean, currently, um, you know, President Biden has you know issued this. Um, or, or put forth this proposal to remove, you know, the millions of lead pipes. They're still in the ground in this country. I mean, the water infrastructure in this country is is uh, uh, crumbling at best. Um, the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, which is the group that like gives our bridges and our roads like a score, a grade, 
of how good it is or how not good it is. They give our water infrastructure in this country, I think it's like a C, a C grade. It's not good. It's, it, just, it has improved. When I first started researching that, it was a D. So it got a little better. Um, but it requires billions of dollars in investment to modernize. Um, our water treatment plants really have a lifespan of 20 to 30 years. And many of our water systems um, that are in, uh, in use right now date back to the 60s and 70s. So like their useful life has passed. And it's just being kind of held together with you know, duct tape and, 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 a, and a hope. <laughs> uh, and so we need to modernize the infrastructure and that's the only way we're gonna make a real dent in the problem with water contamination and we need more regulations. Totally, and those are all big picture things and they all need attention, but it yes. first starts with us becoming yes. educated ourselves and yeah. making the changes in our own family, which obviously you agree with, which is why you do the work that you do. Yes. And when we become that example and we start spreading the word, we tell one other person or they come to our house and they're like, oh, you know, your, your water tastes, you know, better. It's really interesting. My water tastes super weird. It's like chlorinated. Mm -hmm. What do you guys use? And you tell them about the filter yep. and some of the changes that you're making and why it's important to you. And you're, you know, being cautious. You're not being an extremist. You're not, you know, going crazy with things and your family's normal and you live a happy life and you have cheat days and you eat stuff that's there, but you've made these little changes that you feel are protective measures for you and yeah. your family. That's how the message spreads. And that's actually what's happening right now. People are doing Absolutely. these things and health has become one of the main sort of priority priorities for people, especially those in the 40 plus category, because people are realizing we're in this sort of perfect storm. Things are getting worse. There's more and more chemicals that are out there every day, but there's more and more better solutions that we can use that don't have to break the bank that can protect, you know, us and our communities. And then that message has that sort of ripple effect. Uh, and, you know, you've been a huge part of that. And I want to acknowledge you for all the incredible content that you've put out over the years, Laura. It's been fantastic. You've inspired so many people and even people like myself who live and breathe this there's changes that I've made of like, oh, you Amazing. know what? I didn't think about <laughs> that aspect, but that's an easy switch for me to make. Yeah. So I want to acknowledge you and thank you for coming on the podcast today to share your message with our, with our audience. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, you know, the, I, like I, I hope it's obvious and very passionate about this topic. Um, and you know, my big goal here is, you know, to help people understand the scale of this and to take it seriously and to take action. Um, you know, although my Instagram is sort of accessible information for everyone, the core aspect of my work and the courses that I teach are for health professionals because I want there to be more health professionals who can dialogue with their clients and patients and customers um, on these topics. It's a much more efficient way for me to spread this message to work with providers that they themselves have a much, much larger, larger audience and uh, audience of people that are dealing with health issues that might be more motivated to take this stuff seriously. Mm, so important. Can you just mention the, I know there's a couple of courses that are there. Can you just mention them and we'll link to them in the show notes below? Yeah, absolutely. The flagship course, which is where most of my students um, start is a um, five module, 10 hour course called Talking Toxins. Um, and this really covers, first of all, covers a lot of the sort of topics that we covered in this uh, interview, um, it covers like what are the low hanging fruit um, places where if you're having the conversation around toxics with your clients or patients, start with these uh, areas because these are the most accessible and the have uh, the most um, frequent exposures. Um, and then, you know, I have uh, advanced five month certificate course uh, in environmental health for um, health professionals who really want to make the toxicity conversation a more meaningful part of the work that they do. Uh, so people can just check out those courses on my website and feel free to message me if you're a practitioner and you have a question. Incredible. Well, we'll link to those below. And today was so amazing. You took us through a tour of the kitchen. We hope to have you back in the future and maybe yeah, we'll go works. into the bathroom and the bedroom where a lot of these hidden toxins are lurking in the cosmetics that we're all using on a daily basis. So uh, open invitation and I look yeah, forward to that to opportunity. Yeah, I'd love to come back anytime, anytime. Amazing. Well, 
People can follow along. Your Instagram is fantastic. We have the link in the show notes below. Laura, thank you for being on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Drew. Hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. The word fragrance can be any combination of nearly 4,000 chemicals, any combination. They include phthalates. There are carcinogens in there.